Time for the video where we actually start putting our stuff together. Towns and parties. Which is kind of a misnomer since there's only one town, but it just sounds better when said that way. Both your town and your wandering groups count as parties, with the difference being that the wandering groups can move and the town can build. Let's start with the wandering group. When I click on the group, the box in the top right highlights their current status. Manpower, carrying weight, remaining movement, turns of food remaining, and turns of fuel remaining. For food, you use up one piece of food for each person in the group every turn. So if a group has 200 pieces of food and 10 people in it, it has enough food for 20 turns. For fuel, you use up only one piece of fuel every turn, and only if the group is encamped, which I'll show you in a sec. Clicking on the group again brings up a radial menu. I get one option to move, though I can do that also by just right-clicking on another hex. And if I instead hold the right-click button and hover over other hexes, I can see how many movement points I need to get there. To the right of the move button is a make camp button. This takes one movement point to activate and causes my party to set up camp. That means they'll start healing faster and be able to start gathering resources, but they'll also start using their fuel. I'll encamp now. Notice that my team have set up in some little makeshift tents. Opening up the menu again, you'll notice that the movement icon has been replaced by a break camp icon, and that camp icon has been replaced by an icon to go into the manage screen. The other three options, the same whether you're camped or not, are to go to the inventory, equipment, or split party menus. Although once you go into one, you can easily get to the others through the menu bar at the top here. So let's go through those menus, starting with the split party. As the name says, this allows you to break into two groups, which sounds useful, and it is, but the same thing can also be done over here in the inventory menu. The difference between the two menus is whether you can see the equipment of the person you are moving around in a paper doll image on the right, as well as the filter options available to you on the left. The inventory menu also has a spot where you can dispose of items and recycle equipment, but the two menus do share a lot of uses. I rarely use the split party menu myself, but your mileage may vary. The equipment screen shows you the party members on the left, all equipment, or all unequipped equipment if you have this little box checked, in the center, and the currently selected character on the right. If you want to see the details on any piece of gear, you can right-click it. You can also, if you want, right-click a character portrait on the left to get a list of their skills. But personally, I find looking at their skills in the bottom box easier. Next up, the Manage Supplies menu brings up a list of every type of food and fuel that you have, which ones you are allowing to be used on a turn-to-turn -turn basis, and whether you allow any new types of food or fuel you find to be allowed or not. When eating food, you'll be using more than one item per day. The food that gets used will be spread out among all of your food options equally. What that means is, if you have 10 people in a party, a thousand vegetables, and two each of four other types of food, then after one turn, you will be out of the other four types of food, since you will have eaten two each of five different types. And having multiple types of food is good, as the more different types of food you have, the more party-wide bonuses you'll receive, so keeping your meals diverse is something to strive for. The menu on the far left is the village overview, although since this isn't the actual town, there's not really a village to be overviewing here, just a report on your gatherers. And the last tab is production, and if I click on it, all I have is gathering. So I'll show off that tab from the town itself. Let's head to the town now. First up, let's look at the town's equivalent of the village overview screen, this being the actual village and all. On the left side is a synopsis of my town-based characters and their current job tasks. You can see that I have 8 people on gathering, 2 on crafting, and no one currently building any town buildings. On the right side is a report of all resources that are within gathering range. If the yellow hexagon showing my gathering range looks a bit larger than normal, I'll get to that later and the bottom right shows my current list of all buildings in the town. You can see here that I am only allowed to build 10 total buildings, and since I have realism on, 
I am not allowed to have duplicates. Though honestly, unless you have some specific strategy in mind, that isn't too big of a penalty. I can right-click any of the buildings you see here to see the bonus it is currently providing to the town. And if I want to take down a building, either because I want to make room for a different one, or to rebuild the current one with improved materials, then I can click on the small X in the corner. And now, the Production tab. We start in the Gathering tab, and just let me take everyone off real fast. Alright, so in the main screen here, I have a list of every resource that I can harvest, which means it's both within my gathering range, and that I have unlocked the harvesting technology for it. All of my townspeople are in the box to the left, and they are sorted in order of gathering skill, best at the top. The number here shows how many pieces I will get each time I successfully harvest any of these items. The number in parentheses here is how many are currently in my stockpile, and there might be a symbol here if the resource can be used either as a raw food or fuel. The numbers here show how hard the material is to gather, and how far along in the gathering process I currently am. Right now, everything is at zero. So, let's see how to change that. How about the elven wood? It takes 90 gathering points to finish harvesting a bundle of it, which would be 6 pieces of elven wood. Let me take Zona here, who has a gathering rating of 8, and put her in charge of the elven wood. Alright, you'll notice that she is now providing 80 harvest points per turn, and the game is telling me here that it will take 2 turns to finish harvesting the next bundle. Now, let me take another character, say my medic Perzid... <clears throat> my medic Pam, and add her and her gathering skill of 4 as an assistant to Zona. Now my town is gathering at 100 points per turn, so I will gather a bundle every turn. If I had realism off, then the extra 10 points would carry over to the next bundle. But I have it on, so I just get the one bundle per turn with no carryover. So, how is this number calculated? The main gatherer has their skill multiplied by 10, and all assistants have their skill multiplied by 5. The results are all added together. Also, the game is smart enough to have the most qualified gatherer take the lead role. So if I were to place Super Gatherer Head Vika on Elvenwood as well, even if I try to stick her in the back, she'll get placed in front. So to the middle tab, Crafting. You'll notice that the townsperson lift on the left has been resorted. Now that I'm crafting, it's sorting with the best crafters on top. I am currently making two recipes, cooked greens and mushroom soup. The amount of crafting points needed to make any of these is calculated the same way as gathering. Although unlike gathering, the realism difficulty setting doesn't limit my production here. So Branka, who is making the cooked greens with 100 crafting points per day, will make 3 recipes per turn and carry over the remaining 10 crafting points as well. In the meantime, Sorty LaForge here has already carried over some crafting from last turn. This is what the meter looks like for crafting or gathering when progress is partially complete. For the sake of this demonstration, I'll cancel the cooked greens using the X in the corner, so that I can show you how to make a recipe. On the right is my list of unlocked crafting recipes. Let's go into the Cooked Meals tab. And here is our first look at crafting. On the left is the resources available in my town, but only the resources that can be used in the current recipe will be shown. When making anything in Thea the Awakening, you will need to follow a recipe, and a recipe will always require a primary ingredient, a secondary ingredient, and a fuel source. The picture shows what can be chosen to use, and the number below it shows how many you need to make the recipe. So in the top center spot here, I can add vegetables. I need two of them, but I think I'm good on that. Note that the spot I just used is vegetables, but that doesn't mean I have to exactly use the item named vegetables. I also have mushrooms over here, which are a vegetable. If I wanted, I could use them in the primary spot instead. So let me pick a secondary item and a fuel source. And there we go, the cooked greens recipe. On the right here, four numbers have shown up. The top is how many crafting points it will take to make a single recipe of this item. 
The second is how many items I will get for this recipe. For cooked greens, I will get eight of them. Which is, by the way, one of the big reasons to cook, you'll get more food total out of it than you put in. The third number is research. Most, though not all, items will give you research experience points when finished. Sadly, food is one of the exceptions. And the last number is weight. This is telling me what a single item will weigh, in this case, one pound. Granted, I'm making eight of them, so I'm actually making eight pounds of total output, but it's not like my town has a carry limit. Being satisfied with my recipe, I'll click confirm, and this will put the cooked greens on the crafting list. I'll add Branca back on the list to make them. So how about these other buttons? The two here are used if I want to make more or less of the recipe. Notice that as I add more requests, the numbers in the bottom right are going up. The resources for the initial bowl of cooked greens have already been subtracted from my totals, but for each extra bowl, I will need more resources. The numbers in the bottom right are showing me how many more I will need out of how many more I have to supply all of the extra requests, but it won't actually remove those resources from my inventory until they're needed. Because of that, you should be a little careful when making multiple copies of multiple items that share an ingredient. The other two buttons here are used to either raise the number of requests to the absolute maximum based on my current resource stockpiles, or to just give a standing order to keep making them until I run out of raw materials. The four buttons on the side are priority settings. I can increase or decrease the priority of any given crafting task. Priority determines where any given crafter will move to if the task they are currently working on finishes. So, let's take a quick look at a piece of gear so I can show you two other things. How about light armor? The resources selection box is similar to the cooked food, so let me fill it up real quick. Leather, amber, string. Okay, so here is a nice leather doublet. Six armor, one dexterity, and though it isn't mentioned, I will get an extra bonus skill on it for using a gemstone as a crafting material. The four numbers are here again. Unlike the food, this will actually earn me research experience. It's worth six research points. However, there are two more numbers down here now. The gold star is the chance that this item will come out with good quality. A good quality item will be stronger and weigh less than a normal one. The chance of a good quality craft is based entirely on the fuel used to make the item. If I were to replace the string with, say, leather, the good chance goes up from 5% to 6. This is the only effect your choice of fuel has. Also, you can't get a good quality craft at all until you have built a smithy in your town, which is under buildings, which I'll get to in a bit. The broken silver star is the chance an item will be produced with bad quality. A bad quality item will be weaker and weigh more than a normal one. The chance of bad quality is always 20% minus the skill chance of the primary crafter. If I were to start this recipe right now, Bronca would be my primary crafter. Her skill is 10, so the chance of a bad craft would be 20 minus 10, or 10%. It's usually a good idea to have your best crafter make your gear, and have anyone else either support them or make other things like food. And now let's look at construction, or I can make buildings. And let's look at one of the more basic ones, the palisade. If I were to fill up the three wood slots with wood, then you will see that if I build this building, I would get a one shielding bonus to all of my people within the town. However, there is something else about crafting. Just like I could change the vegetables to mushrooms in cooking, I can also use other materials in crafting and construction. So let's change the wooded palisade to an elven wood palisade. Now, not only does this increase the shielding value to three, it also has this attract elf skill on it too. And this is what is important to know about buildings. Each one has, I'll call it a primary numeric effect, which is larger if you build with stronger materials, and some have an ancillary effect which it gives to your town regardless of your choice of crafting materials. But this attraction effect is building independent. 
It is based entirely on what and how much material is used to make it. Elven wood attracts elves no matter if it's used to make a palisade or an herbalist. Example time. I am using 80 elven wood here, so that would get me an attraction of two. But if I were to, say, make a smithy instead, which only needs 50 total wood, I would only get a bonus of one. I'll link the wiki in the video description. It has a full equation on what materials and how many of them you need to get each race and how much material to get extra attraction points per building. As for what attraction means is, and this is an oversimplification as things like how many characters you currently have also play into it, but if you want to know how much of an effect attraction is having, take each source of it and treat that as a 0.5% chance per turn. So if I had a building with one attract elf and another building with two attract elf, then I would have a 1.5% chance to attract an elf every time I hit the end turn button. Now there's no limit to the number of different attractions that can happen per turn. In theory, with the appropriate buildings, I could get a beast, elf, dwar dward, dwarf, orc, human, demon, and goblin all at the same time. As for the other effects, let's go into the research menu, as I promised I would a few videos again. Actually, wait. One more thing before I leave this screen. Whenever you assign someone to a task, their picture over here will reflect it. Sorty is crafting, so he has an anvil icon. Branka is building, so there's a saw icon. Hedvika is gathering, so there's a basket icon. And Scarbamira here has no icon, because I guess she's just sitting around polishing her spear or something. I can also filter out anyone who currently has a job with this checkbox down here. Anyway, to the buildings. So here is the research tab on buildings. You will notice there are 14 different buildings. You start with this one already unlocked, and for all the others you need to spend a research point. Well, almost all. Reminder, you can only have 10 buildings up at a time, and whether you are allowed to have duplicates depends on your realism setting. So, let's go through these. I talked about race attraction earlier, so I'll keep this mostly to the primary numerical and ancillary effects. Starting on the left, and the building you start the game with, the pasture. Building this will give you meat every turn, with stronger materials giving you more meat. Behind the pasture is the cabbage field. Building this will give you a percent chance for a child to show up in your town's inventory every turn. Children are the third way you can grow your population in this game, behind events and attraction. Every turn that you have a child in your inventory, there's a chance he will grow up into an adult. He will always have the options to become a warrior, gatherer, or crafter. He might also have some random other classes available as well. However, some of these other buildings can further affect that growing child's choices. As a first example of that, there's the Herbalist Hut here. The numeric effect of the Herbalist Hut is that it will increase the health regeneration rate of everyone in your town, as well as add herbs to your town inventory every turn. The ancillary effect is that a town with an Herbalist Hut will guarantee that any child growing up in it has the option to turn into a medic class. On the top branch, we have the Smithy. The numeric effect is to raise the smithing skill of anyone in town, as well as enabling the ability to make good quality items. Its ancillary effect is to give any child growing up to be a crafter five bonus skill points. Behind the smithy is the totem. The numeric effect is to raise the magic skill of everyone in town. The ancillary effect is that growing children can become witches, which is the only real natural human magic class. The other building up here is the Blessed Tree Symbol. Building this will shield your town from the Curse of Darkness, and only that specific curse, and make any blessing on a townsperson not expire. It does this by stopping the counter. Blessings in this game last for a fixed number of turns. As long as you are in a town with this building, that counter won't move, but if you leave, it'll start up again. To the bottom, we have the Well. The numeric effect of this is to add a random resource to your town every turn. 
It can add any resource, but it will only choose from the ones you have already unlocked in the gathering tree. Also note that, realism setting or not, this is a building whose numeric effect will not stack. One well is all you can benefit from. Below that is the manger. Its numeric effect is to give everyone in town animal kinship skill, and it has an attract beast rating separate from any other attraction bonus you get from using specific materials. Although in this case, the only other attraction option here is humans, so, you know, meh. Its ancillary effect is it gives 10 bonus points to any child growing up to be a gatherer. Next to the manger is the meeting hall. Its numeric effect is to raise the town's speech, will, and intelligence. And its ancillary effect is to guarantee that children can go into sages, and it also opens up a chance that a child can become a scholar or inventor. Yes, that's a lot of effects in one building, and it also has the widest possible set of attraction-based materials. The first building on the right side is the Watchtower. Its numeric effect is to increase the vision radius around your town, both day and night. Also note that, like the well, you cannot stack this bonus. One tower is all that will help you. Down here is the barracks. Its numeric effect is to add damage to all characters while in town. Its ancillary effect is to add 10 bonus skill points to any child growing up to warrior. Next to the barracks is the archery range. Its numeric effect is to add to the ranged skill of all townspeople. Its ancillary effect is to give any growing child the option to become a hunter. Up here is the palisade. Its numeric effect is to grant bonus shielding to anyone in town. And last, but certainly not least, is the building here, the Blessed Path. It increases the radius that you can gather materials from your town. At its strongest, it can increase the town's harvesting radius two points. Or said another way, it can allow you to gather out to three hexes if made from super strong materials. Like the Well and Tower, its effect cannot be stacked. Also of note is that any hex within the town's gathering radius only costs one movement point to cross, no matter what the terrain actually is. The skill points granted by the smithy, manger, and barracks are random. So when a child grows to, say, a crafter with a smithy present, those five bonus points don't go all into crafting. They are randomly distributed. And those skill point bonuses do not stack. You can't make ten barracks and start cracking out god-slaying warriors. Sorry. And that's all the buildings. I have one last thing to show you in this video, so let me go back to the construction menu and select the Blessed Paths. You may notice something off about the materials here. On the top row, we have basic string and straw, like many other recipes. But on the right, instead of wood, we have the symbol for dryad wood. The same thing is in the center. We have the basic gem amber, but also granite, which is an advanced stone, silver, which is an advanced metal, and dryad wood again, which is an advanced lumber. In any recipe, the symbol you see is for the lowest possible form of that material you can use. 95% of the time, that will be the lowest form of material, and as such, you can use any of that material you want. The string here, for example, can be string, vine, or spider silk. I mean, if I had 40 of it on hand anyway. But for those last 5%, you will see an advanced material. Take Two examples here, dryad wood and silver. Now let's head over to the tech tree for gathering. Looking at the dryad wood, there is no other wood on a higher branch of it on the tree. So if I wanted to use wood, I would have to use dryad wood. And the silver is right here. There is only one other material on a higher branch, so I could either use silver or this hidden material, but that's it. And that's going to do it for this video that ran about twice as long as I was hoping for. That's all about your towns and parties. And now that we've seen all the things that go into putting your characters together, next video will be the one where we finally get to show why we're doing it all. The Combat Primer. I'll see you there. Right, right. 
derp. In the inventory screen, when you want to transfer items between parties, it's a simple drag and drop, after which you choose how many to put in each party. However, sometimes you might just want to throw entire stacks from one window to the other. You can pull this off with a simple shift click. It'll probably save you a lot of time over a long game.